more information, click here. Live from Munich, Germany, it's the Q. Covering DataWorks Summit Europe 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here in Munich, Germany for DataWorks Summit 2017, formerly Hadoop Summit, um, powered by Hortonworks. It's their event, but now called DataWorks because data is at the center of the value proposition. Um, Hadoop plus all data and storage. I'm John Furrier. My co-host Dave Vellante, our next guest is Scott Now, is the CTO of Hortonworks, joining us again from the keynote stage. Good to see you. Again, great Thanks to- Thanks for having me back. Great to be here. Love Scott. having you back. Get, uh, get down and dirty and get technical. Um, super excited um, about the conversations that are happening in the industry right now for a variety of reasons. One is, you can't get more excited about what's happening in the data business. Machine learning, AI, is really has uh, brought up the hype around uh, to mainstream America. People can visualize AI and see the, the self-driving car and understand now how software is powering all this, but still it's data-driven and Hadoop is extending into data. You're seeing that in natural extension and Cloudera has filed their S1 to go public, so it brings back the conversations of this open source community that's been doing all this work in the big data industry, originally riding in on the horse of Hadoop. So, I want to, you know, and you guys have an update to your Hadoop data works data platform, but we'll get to in a second, but I want to ask you, a lot of stories around Hadoop, I say that Hadoop was the first horse that you know, everyone rode in on in the big data industry. When I say big data industry, I mean like DevOps, cloud, the whole open source ethos. But it's evolving, but it's not being replaced. So I want you to, to, to clarify your position on this because we were just talking about some of the, the false premises, a lot of stories being written about the demise of Hadoop, long live Hadoop. Yeah, well. Uh, how long do we have? <laughs> you know, I, I think you hit it first. We're here at DataWorks Summit 2017, and we we rebranded it. This previously was Hadoop Summit, right? And and we rebranded it really to recognize that there's this bigger thing going on, and it's not just Hadoop. Hadoop is a big contributor, a big driver, very important part of the ecosystem. But it's more than that, and it's really about being able to manage and deliver analytic content on all data across that data's life cycle, from when it gets created at the edge, to it's moving through networks, to it's landed and stored in a cluster, to analytics run and decisions go back out. It's that entire life cycle, and, and you mentioned some of the mega trends, and I talked about this morning in, in, uh, in the opening keynote, right? Um, with AI and streaming and IoT, all of these things kind of converging are creating a much larger problem set and frankly opportunity for us as an industry to go solve. And, and so that's the context that we're really looking at. And there's real demand there. This is not like, I mean certainly there's a hype factor on AI, but IoT is real. You have um, data now, not just a back office concept, you have a front facing business centric. Yeah. I mean there's real customer demand here. There's real customer demand and it really creates um, the ability to dramatically change a business. You know, a simple example that I used uh, on stage this morning is think about the electric utility business, right? And so I live in Southern California. You know, 25 years ago, by the way, I studied to be an electrical engineer. <laughs> 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? That business, while not entirely simple, was about building a big power plant and distributing electrons out to all the consumers of electrons. One direction, and the optimization of that grid and network and that business was very hard and there was billions of dollars at stake. Fast forward to today, right? Now you've still got those generating plants online, but you've also got folks like me generating their own power and putting it back into the grid. So now you've got bi-directional electrons. The optimization is totally different. And then how do you figure out how most effectively to create capacity and distribute that capacity? Because creating capacity that's not consumed is 100% spoiled. So it's a huge data problem, but it's a huge data problem meaning uh, IOT, right? Devices, smart meters, devices out at the edge creating data, doing it in real time. A cloud blew over, my, my generating capacity on my roof went down, so I've got to pull from the grid. Combining all of that data to make real time decisions is, it, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars and it's being done today. 
in an industry, you know, it's not a high-tech Silicon Valley kind of industry, electric utilities are taking advantage of this technology today. So we were talking off camera about, you know, some commentary about the, you know, Hadoop has failed, and obviously you take exception to that. And, I, and, and you, you also made the point it's not just about Hadoop, but in a way, I mean, it is, because Hadoop was the catalyst of all this. So mm -hmm. why has Hadoop not failed, in your view? Well, because we have customers, and you know, the, the great thing about conferences like this is we're actually able to get a lot of folks to come in and talk about what they're doing with the technology and how they're driving business benefit and share that business benefit to their colleagues. Um, so we see that ben business benefit coming along. You know, in any hype cycle, you know, people can go down a path, maybe they had false expectations, right? Early on, you know, uh, six years ago, ten years ago, you were talking about, hey, this open source Hadoop is going to come along and replace EDW. Complete fallacy, right? What I talked about in that opportunity, being able to store all kinds of disparate data, being able to manage and maneuver analytics in real time, that's the value proposition, and it's very different than some of the legacy tech. So if you view it as, hey, this thing's going to replace that thing, okay, maybe not. But the point is, it's very successful for well, what it's being designed to do. Just to clarify, to do. That the, what you just said there, that was, you guys never took that position. Or we never took that Cloudera position. Cloudera did with their Impala, was their initial, uh, you could, Dave, I mean, that, you don't agree with that? Publicly they would say, oh, it's not a replacement, but you're right, I mean, the, uh, the, the actions were maybe were designed to do that. set in the marketplace <laughs> that that might have they been did. one of the they, outcomes. Yeah, but they pivoted quickly when they realized that was a failed strategy, but I mean, that, but that yeah. became a premise that people locked in if, on. If that becomes your yardstick for measuring, then, sure. then so, oh, but, but wouldn't you agree that, that Hadoop in many respects was designed to solve some of the problems that EDW never could? Exactly, so, so you know, again, when you think about the, the variety of data, when you think about the analytic content, doing time series analyses, it's very hard to do in a relational model. So it's a new tool in the workbench to go solve analytic problems. Uh, and so when you look at it from that perspective, and I use the utility example, the manufacturing example, uh, uh, financial, consumer finance, uh, telco, all of these companies are using this technology, leveraging this technology to solve problems they couldn't solve before and frankly to build new businesses that they couldn't build before because they didn't have access to that real-time streaming and, data. And so money did shift from pouring money into the EDW with limited returns because you were at the steep part of, or the flat part of the S-curve to, hey, let's put it over here in this so-called big data thing. And that's why the market, I think, was conditioned to sort of come to that simple conclusion. But dollars, the spending did shift, did it not? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you subscribe kind of that, to that herd mentality, and you know, the net increase, the net new expenditure in the new technology is always going to outpace the growth of the existing kind of plateau technology. That's just math. The growth, yes, but not the size, not the absolute dollars. And so yeah. you have a lot of companies right now struggling in the traditional legacy space, right? and you got this rocket ship going in Big yeah, data. And, and again, I think if you think about kind of the converging forces that are out there, in addition to um, you know IoT and streaming, the ability, frankly, Hadoop is an enabler of AI. When you think about the success of AI and machine learning, it's about having massive, massive, massive amounts of data, right? And and I think back, you know, 25 years ago, my first data mart was 30 gigabytes, and we thought that was all the data in the world, <laughs> right? Huge. Now it fits on your phone. So, so when you think about just having the utter capacity and the ability to actually process that capacity of data, these are technology breakthroughs that have been driven in the core open source and Hadoop community. When combined with the ability then to execute in cloud and ephemeral kinds of workloads, you combine all of that stuff together now, instead of going to capital committee for $20 million for a bunch of hardware to do an exabyte kind of study where you may not get an answer that means anything, you can now spin that up in the cloud and for a couple of thousand dollars get the answer, take that answer and go build a new system of insight that's going to drive your business. And this is a whole new area of opportunity so driven we, by the convergence of all that tech. So we agree. I mean, it's absurd to say Hadoop and big data has failed. We, uh, I mean, this is crazy. Okay, but despite the growth, I call it profitless prosperity, can the industry fund itself? I mean, you've got to make big bets. Yarn, Tez, different clouds. How does the industry turn into one that is profitable and growing? Well, I mean, obviously it, it creates new business models and new ways of, of monetizing software and deploying software. 
you know, one of the key things that, that is core to our belief system is that really leveraging and working with and nurturing the community um, is going to be a key success factor for our business, right? Um, nurturing that innovation and collaboration across the community to keep up with the rate of pace of change is one of the aspects of being relevant as a business. And then obviously creating a great service experience for our customers so that they, they know that they can depend on enterprise class support, enterprise class security and governance and operational management in the cloud and on-prem uh, and creating that value proposition along with the, uh, the advanced and accelerated delivery of innovation is where I think you know, we kind of intersect uniquely in, uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. And one of the things that I think that people point out, and this, I have this conversation all the time with people who try to squint through the, you know, the Wall Street implications of, of the value proposition of the industry, and this is something that I want to get your thoughts on because open source at this era that we're living in today is creating so much value outside of just Hortonworks and your, your company. Um, Dave would made a comment on the intro package we were doing is that the practitioners are getting a lot of value, people out in the field. So these are the white spaces of value and they're actually transformative. Mm -hmm. Can you give some examples where um, things are getting done that are real of real value um, as use cases that are, uh, that are highlighted that you guys can highlight? Because I think that's the um, unwritten story that no one's talking about is that there's the rising tide floating all boat happening. Yeah, so, yeah you know, there is. I mean, what are some of those use cases? The white some, spaces. So, yeah, some of those use cases, again, it really involves kind of integrating legacy traditional transactional information, right? Very valuable information about a company, its operations, its customers, uh, its products, and all those kinds of things. But being able to combine that with the ability to do real time sensor management and ultimately have a technology stack that enables kind of the connection of all of those sources of data for an analytic. And that's an important differentiation, you know, for, for the first 25 years of my career, right? It was all about, let's pull all this data into a place and then let's do something with it and then we can push analytics back. Not an entirely bad model, but a model that breaks in the world of IoT connected devices. There just frankly isn't enough money to spend on bandwidth to make that happen. And as fast as the speed of light is, it creates latency so those decisions aren't going to be able to be made in time. So we're seeing even in traditional, I mentioned the utility business, think about manufacturing yeah. oil and gas, right? Sensors everywhere. Being able to take advantage, not of, not of collecting all the sensor data and, and all of that, but being able to actually create analytics based on sensor data and push those analytics out to the sensors to make real-time decisions that can affect hundreds of millions of dollars of, of production or equipment yeah. are the use cases that we're seeing be deployed today. And that's complete white space that was unavailable before. Yeah, and right? customer demand too. I mean, Dave and I were also debating about the, um, this not being a new trend. This is just big data happening. The customers are demanding production um, workloads. So you're seeing a lot more forcing function driven by the customer. And you guys have some news I want to get to and get your thoughts on um, HTP, the uh, Hortonworks Data Platform 2.6. What's the key news there? Obviously real time, you were talking about real time. Yeah, it's about real time, uh, real time flexibility and choice, right? You know, motherhood and apple pie. <laughs> uh, and the major highlights of that upgrade. Yeah, so, so the upgrade really inside of Hive, we now have operational analytic query capabilities uh, where we can do tactical response time, second, sub-second kind of response time. You know, uh, Hadoop and Hive wasn't previously known for that kind of a tactical response. We've been able to now add inside of that technology the, the ability to, to do that workload. And we have customers who, building these white space applications who have hundreds or thousands of users or applications that depend on consistency of very quick analytic response time. We now deliver that inside the platform. What's really cool about it, in addition to the fact that it works, mm -hmm. is, is that we did it inside of Hive. So we didn't create yet another project or yet another thing that a customer has to integrate to or rewrite their application. So any Hive-based application can now take advantage of this performance enhancement, and that's part of our thinking of it as a platform. The second thing inside of that that we've done that really accretes to those kinds of workloads uh, is, is we've really enhanced the ability to do incremental data acquisition, right? Whether it be streaming, whether it be batch, upserts, right? I'm a SQL person, doing upserts. 
being able to do that data maintenance in an ACID compliant fashion completely automatically and behind the scenes so that those applications again can just kind of run without any heavy lifting so behind So it's data in motion kind of thing going on, right? It, it's, it's anywhere from data in motion even to batch to mini batch and anywhere kind of in between. So, but okay. when you're doing those incremental data loads, you know, it's easy to get the same file twice by mistake. You don't want to double count. You want to have sanctity of the transactions. We now handle that inside of Hive with ACID compliance. So, a layperson question for the CTO, if I may. You mentioned Hadoop was not known for a sort of real-time response. You just mentioned ACID. It was never, no, no, or in the early days, known for a sort of ACID you know, compliance. Others would say, you know, Hadoop, the original big data platform is not, Designed for the matrix, uh, the, the the matrix math of of AI, for example, right. are these misconceptions? And and like Tim Berners Lee, when we met, Tim Berners Lee, you know, Web 2.0. This is what the web was designed for. Would you say the same thing about Hadoop yeah, and I mean, big data? I mean, ultimately, uh, from my perspective, and and kind of netting it out, Hadoop was designed for the easy acquisition of data, the easy onboarding of data, and then. Uh, and uh, once you've onboarded that, that it, it also was known for enabling new kinds of analytics that could be plugged in. Certainly starting out with MapReduce and HDFS was kind of the core, but the whole idea is I have now the flexible way to easily acquire data in its native form without having to apply a schema, without having to have any format I can just store it. I can get it exactly as it was and store it, and then I can apply whatever schema, whatever rules, whatever analytics on top of that that I want. So the, the center of gravity from my mind has really moved up to Yarn, which enables a multi-tenancy approach to having pluggable multiple different kinds of file formats and pluggable different kinds of, of uh, analytics and data access methods, whether it be SQL, whether it be machine learning, whether it be uh, HBase for lookup and indexing and anywhere kind of in between. It, it's, that, it's that Swiss army knife, as it were, for handling all of this new stuff that is changing every second we sit here. Yeah. Data has changed. And just a quick follow-up, if I can, just clarification. So you said new types of analytics that can be plugged in by design because of its openness, is that right? Or, or by design because of its openness and the flexibility that the platform was, was built for. Um, in addition, you know, on the, on the, uh, the performance, we've also uh, got a new update to Spark and usability, consumability, uh, and collaboration for data scientists using the latest versions of Spark inside the platform. We've got a whole lot of other uh, features and functions that, that our customers have asked for. And then on the flexibility and choice, it's available public cloud infrastructure as a service, public cloud platform as a service, on-prem x86, and net new uh, on-prem with Power8. Scott, final question for you. Just as the industry evolves, what are some of the key areas that open source can pivot to that really takes advantage of the machine learning, the AI trend that's going on? Because you start to see that really increase the narrative around the importance of data. And a lot of people are scratching their heads going, okay, I need to do the back office things, I need to set up my IT, I need to have all this great stuff, all these open source projects, all the, the, the Hadoop data platform, but then I got to get down and dirty, I might do multiple clouds, on the hybrid cloud going on, I might want to leverage some of all those new cool containers and Kubernetes and microservices and all those DevOps. Where's that transition happening? As a CTO, where do you see that and how do you talk to customers about that, this transition, this evolution of how the data business is even getting more and more um, mainstream? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the big thing that people had to get over is we've, we've reversed polarity from, again, 30 years of, I want a stack vendor to have an integrated stack of everything, I plug and play, it's integrated end to end, it might not be 100% what I want, but the cost leverage that I get out of the stack versus what I'm going to go do, that's perfect. In this world, it's the opposite. It's about enabling the ecosystem. And that's where having, and, and by the way, it's a combination of open source and proprietary software that, that you know, some of our partners have proprietary software, that's okay, but it's really about enabling the ecosystem. And I think the biggest service that we as an open source community can do is to continue to kind of keep that standard kernel for the platform yeah. and make it very usable and very uh, easy for uh, mini apps and software providers and other folks it's to plug into It's a thousand flower bloom testing. kind of concept. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about, the white spaces as yeah. use cases are evolving very rapidly and then the bigger apps are kind of getting settling into the workload yeah, with and, real time. And, you know, think, of, think about the, the next generation of IT professional, the next generation of business professional grew up with iPhones, Android yeah. phones. 
they grew up in a mini app world where I'm going to download an app, I'm going to try it, it's a widget, boom, and it's going to help me get yeah. something done. But it's not a big stack that I'm going to spend 30 yeah. years to implement. And, I, right? yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I want to take those widgets and connect them together to do things that, that I haven't been able to do before. Yeah. And that's how this ecosystem is really yeah, going to Very DevOps in. culture, um, very agile. That's their mindset. Yeah. Well, Scott, congratulations on your 2.6 upgrade. And, uh, We're thrilled about it. Great, uh, great stuff. Asset compliance, really big deal. Um, again, these compliance things, these little things are important in the enterprise, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming on theCUBE. It's the DataWorks in Germany and Munich. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching. More coverage live here in Germany after this short break.